Here they are. Now try to guess the trajectories these balls will follow. You can't do it? Don't worry. Nobody can. This is the three body problem. If you're watching or intend to watch the series of the same name on Netflix, Three Body Problem, I can assure you that we're not going to give away any spoilers in this video. What we are going to do is try to help you understand what the three body problem is from a scientific point of view, what we mean by problem in this context, whether it has any direct effects on our lives, and what its practical applications in the field of space science are. Ciao ragazzi, this video was written and filmed in Italian by our team of scientists, storytellers and video makers, manually translated into English, but, but, dubbed with artificial intelligence. Long live culture and let's go back to the video. Let's get back to our simulation, the one I was showing you earlier. These three balls are affected by reciprocal gravitational attraction. They attract each other. At first everything seems fine, but after a while you realize that the paths are absolutely random, so random in fact that there is no analytic formula, I repeat, no analytic formula, that can describe their motion. This problem has puzzled physicists and astronomers for who knows how long, certainly well over 300 years. At this point one might say, but who really gives a hoot about these three bodies? But actually, we really do give a hoot because if we hadn't found a way to tackle this complex problem, we would never have been able to land on the moon or launch satellites for our telecommunications. We wouldn't have been able to travel in space and we couldn't send out space probes or contemplate perhaps visiting other planets in the future. But we'll get to that. Let's take a small step backwards and start with something a bit simpler like figuring out what happens when there are just two bodies involved. For that, I'll hand over to our resident mathematician, Mary Bosco. Let's start with the basics. In everyday life, gravity is the force that makes things fall, like this book here, or what simply keeps us anchored to the ground. This is true when we've got something with a really small mass, like this book, or ourselves, for example, being attracted by an object with a much bigger mass, in this case, the Earth. The disparity is such that the bigger body essentially remains stationary while the smaller one falls towards it. But what happens when the two bodies have more compatible masses like Earth and the Moon? Who attracts who in that case? This is called the two-body problem and the answer is that if the bodies are moving at the right speed, they start orbiting their common center of mass. To describe what's happening, that is, their trajectories, we use the law of universal gravitation that Isaac Newton formulated back in 1687. This tells us that a force acts between the two bodies which increases as their respective masses increase and decreases as the distance between them increases. From this law, we can derive a mathematical formula that allows us to calculate where the two objects are at any given moment, instant by instant. For example, if one of the two bodies has a significantly greater mass than the other, as is the case with the Sun and one of the planets, what happens is that the lighter one will trace an elliptical path around the other. But if we throw a third body into the mix, the three-body problem arises. And that's when chaos enters into the equation, literally. What happens in this case isn't just an interesting theoretical exercise in and of itself, it has significant practical applications. Think, for example, about the importance of calculating the trajectory of a space probe that needs to visit a planet. It's a three-body problem. One is the probe, one is the planet, and the other is the sun. In this scenario, each object feels the gravitational pull of the other two, making the interaction more complex. If we try to devise an equation for the motion of one of these three bodies, starting from Newton's law of universal gravitation as we did before, we fail miserably. Even Isaac Newton wasn't able to do it and he was nobody's fool. He failed because the problem can't be solved, at least not exactly. There isn't an exact formula that describes the behavior of the three bodies instant by instant. By that, I mean a formula in which, for example, I might insert the position of one of the three bodies at a certain instant, and it would then tell me where it will be at some future instant. The fact that there's no exact formula was proven by the French mathematician Henri Poincaré at the end of the 19th century. This means that a system like this, that is, one made up of three bodies interacting with each other, is what we call unpredictable, or better yet, chaotic. It means that even if we know what's happening in the system at a specific moment with a minimum level of uncertainty, so a tiny inaccuracy, that uncertainty grows exponentially, so very rapidly, and in no time at all, we find that we have absolutely no idea what's going to happen with the trajectories. 
Weather patterns, for instance, are chaotic, and that's precisely why the weather forecast can't be accurate for more than three to four days into the future. After that, it's really just a shot in the dark. So the moral of the story is that it's an unsolvable problem, but if it's unsolvable, how is it possible that we can go into space and onto the moon, send out space probes, and even think about landing on Mars? In our practical examples, that is, in our real-world applications, there's a trick of sorts. The third body, the space probe, for example, has such a negligible mass, I mean, it's so tiny compared to the planets, that it's considered to have no gravitational effect on the other bodies. So, essentially, the situation is less problematic because it's as if one of the three bodies is not even there. That's precisely why, in this case, the problem isn't called the three-body problem anymore, but rather, it's known as the restricted three-body problem. The restricted three-body problem is significantly simpler because one of the three bodies has a negligible effect. So, the problem turns into a variation of the two-body problem, which we know how to solve thanks to Newton's law of universal gravitation. In this scenario, we can determine the paths of probes in space, plan their maneuvers with a pretty good level of accuracy, and so on. Without all that, we never would have made it to the moon, and we'd also know next to nothing about the solar system because we wouldn't have been able to send out probes to explore it, and we wouldn't have the awesome pictures that we have from space telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope. These space telescopes are strategically sent to specific spots in space that are gravitationally stable, known as Lagrange points, whose locations have been established precisely thanks to the use of the restricted three-body problem. But how do we figure out these trajectories in real life, thanks to computers? As we don't have explicit formulas, we use the brute force of computer calculations to approximate the equations that govern the motion of their orbits. With enough computing power, and by that I mean precision, in a reasonable amount of time, computers can calculate the paths of space probes with a level of accuracy that ensures the mission's success. We might not find an exact solution, but we can find one that's good enough to achieve what needs to be done. But what if... Instead of three bodies, we actually had four, a thousand, or even a million. So can we solve this problem when we've got, say, n bodies? This is a big question for physicists and astronomers. Consider the solar system, for instance. To figure out planet orbits with a decent level of accuracy, we need to consider how they interact with each other. For n-body problems, the calculations definitely get longer and more tedious, but the basic idea remains the same. What we definitely need are supercomputers capable of crunching some really heavy numbers. In these supercomputers, which are found in data centers scattered around the globe, they run n-body simulations, which means they calculate the trajectories of a massive number of particles. These simulations are utilized in physics, cosmology, and even engineering to study all those situations in which the calculations are beyond our reach. To simulate the evolution of the universe on a large scale and the formation of big cosmic structures, for example, just imagine, some simulations can involve up to 15 billion particles, all interacting with each other. Okay, it's beautiful in theory, but what about in practice? I mean, is a triple star system like Trisolaris a realistic possibility, or is it just something out of science fiction? Yes, there are systems with three stars. In fact, there are hundreds of them. And I'll tell you what's more. To find the nearest triple system, you only need to go around the corner, astronomically speaking. I'm talking about the system involving Alpha Centauri A and B and Proxima Centauri, which at 4.2 light years away is the closest star to us. Alpha Centauri A and B are a pair of stars that are relatively close to each other, around which the very distant Proxima Centauri orbits. And there are also some planets in this system, so we can say that a situation like Trisolaris is actually possible, and it's not science fiction. Another three-star system that you can see every night with the naked eye is that of Alpha Ursi Minoris, which is the system that contains the North Star. This case also involves a supergiant star with a companion nearby, and a third distant star that orbits around the pair. And almost all triple star systems are organized in this way, in that there are two stars close to each other that form a pair, and then there's another star going around them a great distance away. This is actually the most stable way to keep three bodies together, with the configuration preventing them from interfering with each other to the point where one of the three eventually gets shot away. Way to go, Mary. Way to go. Guys, what does all of this tell us? If you ask me, it tells us something very important about mathematics, about physics, but really, I'd say about science in general. Often, scientific curiosity focuses on seemingly useless matters, things that are purely theoretical. For instance, 
What's the use of knowing what happens to three bodies linked by gravity? Well, right at that moment, maybe there's not much use at all. But after three centuries, it allowed us to accomplish the moon landing, probably the biggest endeavor in human history, which then led to an incredible technological evolution, one that we all benefit from today. And this is, undoubtedly, the biggest proof of how curiosity, even the most abstract kind, even the kind that seems to exist just for its own sake, is actually one of the most powerful forces we've got at our disposal. It just goes to show that we must never, ever stop asking questions. Thanks so much for sticking with us till the end. See you again soon, right here on Geopop Everyday Science. Bye.